Well, I want to jump right into the show. Folks, today I have an incredible guest. He was a member of the Elite Dev Guru, former SEAL Team 6. He is a highly decorated veteran who has been to hell and back, in my opinion. He grew up in the Lone Star State. He was in Desert Shield, Desert Storm. His combat search and rescue operations, his sniper operations alone, let alone high threat mobile security operations and reconnaissance, just way too long to list. He was also one of the original 33 federal air marshals who were in place, remember, prior to the 9-11 attacks against the U.S.? He has a tactical company. He was in all five seasons of History Channel's Top Shot. He's been on virtually every major television news station and morning talk show from Fox News, Morning Joe, CBS. He was on the Military Channel's Deadliest Tech, Spec Ops, History Channel's Sniper Deadliest Missions, History Channel's Top Gun, so much more. I could just go on and on all day, but without further ado, it is my pleasure to welcome him back on the program. Craig Sawman Sawyer, it is a pleasure to have you on, my friend. Thank you, Sheila. Always a pleasure. Yes, sir. It's a pleasure to have you back on. Well, listen, where I want to start might seem like a funny place, but let's start with the border chaos the, as I call it, the George Soros-sponsored invasion that's happening at the southern border. You're down on the southern border. You've been taking footage with some of your, you know, your elite pals working together, getting in some real tough terrain. You're no stranger to rough terrain. But, you know, some of the stuff that you've uncovered, get into that for us. And then I really want to know your opinion as a seasoned, highly elite veteran who's looking at the invasion of our country, as a man who was willing to lay his very life down for this country. What are your thoughts as you see what's happening, this chaos at that border? Well, it's very upsetting, obviously, and you tagged on it earlier. You mentioned George Soros and those types of political players that fund and support these types of of political actions. We've got people from Central and South America being sent here by somebody who's orchestrating this. People haven't just uh, decided upon their own decades or generations past, let's rally up, you know, tens of thousands of people and go storm the U.S. border. That's never been tolerated. So what's going on now? So I do believe it's, it's... It's very specifically orchestrated by the people that do not have the American citizens' best interest in mind. So it was upsetting to see this surge. And knowing a lot of federal and local law enforcement in southern Arizona, I realized there were some things that we could do between other projects in Veterans for Child Rescue, which is the nonprofit organization I founded, that we could take some of our assets and personnel and go down to the border and assist primarily Customs and Border Patrol, but other agencies and units as well, by observing and reporting. It's a mountainous region, so it really just goes back to um, sniper operations in the special operations community, rucking up and grabbing a big backpack full of uh, night vision, thermal, long-range optics, and you know carrying the full armament of weapons, suppressors and pistol and everything else for your protection. And then sneaking in up to the to the top of some of these mountaintops and filming it and sharing it with federal law enforcement. Whenever we see big groups transiting dope loads into the United States, we report their locations and direct law enforcement to them to make the uh, pickup and arrest. And we also note the uh, locations of the cartel scouts. So we've got foreign crime syndicate personnel, Mexican drug cartel personnel living in the United States, manning our mountaintop locations in the continental United States uh, year round. And they've lived here for years and they get resupplied usually every seven to 10 days with water, batteries, and swap out personnel and food and and that kind of thing. The cartel scout's job is to watch with long-range optics, binos, and then radio to the drug and human traffickers coming across the fence how to avoid our law enforcement who are trying to defend our nation against this criminal invasion. So we've got hostile, almost combatants manning strategic terrain in the continental United States, and we're doing precious little about it. I've talked to all the different agencies about it. I'm like, look, couldn't we get some helicopters in there, run these guys off, keep them off? And they said, oh, yeah, we absolutely could. But we don't really seem to have the national political will to run them off there and keep them off there. So it's a political game. We're trying to be 
tolerant, quote unquote. So, you know, it's a lie that we need to be tolerant of criminal invaders. You should never be tolerant of that which will kill you or that which is harmful. And so we've been suckered into this political correctness lie that we need to tolerate that which is harmful for us. There are a lot of different aspects to it, but pretending like criminal invaders are somehow just the fruit picking families of decades past is absolutely untrue. A lot of these people coming in now are armed with AK-47s. They got big dope loads and communications equipment that they don't want your food or water. And they don't want a job. They want to bring their dope load because they're they're moving in millions of dollars worth of narcotics and methamphetamine and this kind of thing. So this is what we're looking at down there. So we can run these cartel scouts off of their mountaintops and op- occupy it for a couple days at a time and report to law enforcement. And that's some of the work that we're doing down there. And just being respectful of those that are fighting the good fight, those that have to live down there as law enforcement and protect our border, try to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. And sadly, some other groups, yeah, they're just looking for action. They want to play, they want to play soldier and they, you know, maybe they never served in the military or they did very little and they want to kind of entertain themselves. So they show up down there with, with all this equipment, hoping for a shootout. And it's obviously counterproductive. We need people that will coordinate with law enforcement and augment them respectfully and be part of the solution again and not part of the problem. So that's that's the spirit and the coordination that we have always gone down there with. And it's and uh, the relationship's very strong. So we appreciate uh, everybody that defends our border. I'm in agreement there. Well, there was an interesting article up in The Guardian. Our country is full, Trump claims. I mean, you got to love these fake news bought and paid for minions out there that are just spinning these headlines. But Trump has urged Homeland Security officials to close the border. We see these headlines all throughout the month of April. Contracts in question now. There's one up at Always Reliable CNN. Yeah, right. Contracts in question could stall some construction of Trump's border wall. Just today, again, Trump adding another 320 troops to the border. We already saw this month that, of course, the Pentagon awarded nearly a billion in emergency funds to build that. But, you know, we've also got this chaos going down there. We've also got, in my opinion, seditious and treasonous traitors. What if a group of highly elite Delta Force boys and Navy SEALs teamed up and start picking off these cartel members coming into the border? I mean, no one else is protecting our border. You swore to protect this country against domestic and foreign enemies. Hey, these are foreign enemies coming in. You know, if you start picking them off, what are the implications of something a move like that. Well, then that group would be interdicted by law enforcement and prosecuted. They will prosecute an American much more severely than they will a criminal invader, it seems. It's a very frustrating situation. It's backwards because we have traitors in a lot of our positions as elected officials. Let's face it. We have a president who is trying his level best from everything that I can gather. And the intelligence community and the federal law enforcement community and the political representatives that I know, they all say, hey, Craig, uh, President Trump means what he says. And he wants that border secured so that there's safe and secure and intelligent and reasonable immigration and not this criminal invasion of ISIS and Al-Qaeda and diseased cartel members and, and people bringing poison and sex slaves across our border by the millions. Obviously, that's not healthy. So anybody that, that pretends it is is an absolute uh, traitor and enemy to the American people because that really does speak for itself. It's common sense. So uh, it's frustrating to know that uh, these groups would be prosecuted very swiftly by law enforcement. But at the same time, I do understand it because there has to be a process by which we defend our our borders and a a level of standard behavior to live up to. But having said that, there also needs to be the proper support. So could Border Patrol absolutely lock down that border if they were given the full level of federal support that they deserve? Yes, ma'am. They absolutely could. Uh, They know how to do it. But there are some weak links up and down the chain of command in our federal government. And some of those people don't want our border to be effectively secured. There are people essentially betraying us, subverting the president. They're subverting our national will to protect our border and get control of it. So it's very porous. And it's just going to take a little more time, a little more energy, a little more legislation, a little more funding. But we will get that border locked down. I am confident of that. I think it's not going to happen overnight. But um, one of the reasons we're seeing such a big surge right now is because they know that President Trump means business and that he is absolutely going to lock that thing down. So now they're trying to rush in 
ahead of that wall going up and the, the drones and the patrolling and everything else that will actually gain absolute control over that border in the future. So these are dynamic times. It's a, it's a very interesting situation. And um, one of the things that I, I'd like to talk about are these humanitarians, because that's, that's an issue too. We've got radical extremists on the left end of the spectrum that are so naive it's like the commercial where the, the lady in the bikini jumps up on the beach and she goes, oh, look, dolphins. And she runs into the water and there's like danger music and there's this big shark feeding frenzy. You see all these shark fins out there, right? In her mind, she wants to go play with the dolphins. And then you can relate to it, right? Who doesn't? But she doesn't understand what the threat really is. Same exact situation, Sheila, with these humanitarians. Oh, we would just want to go give these nice families water for their children. Journey into the United States. Welcome. I understand that sentiment. It's biblical to be a good Samaritan. And I do understand where they're, where they're trying to come from. What's sad and tragic about it is they have no earthly clue the level of actual threat and that this is a major cartel run drug and human sex trafficking corridor and that there are scouts watching them from the mountaintops. This is a multi billion dollar industry. And that these guys are armed and then they will absolutely butcher these humanitarians and string them up in the trees and take their equipment and phones and communications and, and money and food from them if they so happen to need it. And so law enforcement let me know, hey, this happens all the time, Craig. Please help us alert people. Like, don't come down here. These are not puppies wandering through the fence. Oh, let's go pet the nice immigrant. My family own a lot of ranch land down near the border. And generations past, there used to be little migrant families that would come and they would end up stranded under a bush or tree and they'd be dehydrated and out of food and in trouble physically in the hot sun heat stroke and so forth well my rancher family would bring them food and water and make sure they were okay because it was like genuinely a family like a mother and father and two or three kids or something they were trying to come here because they did want to genuinely get work and pick fruit for a living and that kind of thing but that's no longer what we're seeing that's actually a rare scenario anymore so no longer are they a, a pleasant little migrant family a lot of them it's adult males They've armed to the teeth. They've got dope loads. They've got communications. If there's anybody with them, it's not their family. It's a staged family or kid as a free pass to exploit and capitalize on those stupid loopholes that our betrayers and, and traitors have worked into our system to allow our enemies to come in and just abuse our own system and exploit the, the loopholes. So we've got to unite on this and get smart as a nation. You don't see other nations with this ridiculous level of vulnerability and ineptitude. We have millions of genius and very intelligent people in this country, but sadly, they are not in charge. What's wrong with our federal government is that jobs are too guaranteed. There's too much job security. And you may ask, well, Craig, what's wrong with job security? I would like that. Well, yes, so would I. But the problem is we're dealing with humans. And when you take away a human's incentive to perform, if, if I had two twins and I told one of them, hey, man, you're only going to collect a check as long as you're productive and you're part of the solution, he would do very well, generally speaking. And if I told the other twin, hey, you know what? It doesn't matter how you perform or if you perform. You're going to be guaranteed this job and your paycheck. Well, he's going to get lazy and put his feet up and go, well, screw it. Why would I put, why would I bust my hump if I'm going to get paid either way? And so that's the problem with the federal government is there's too much job security. and Everybody wants that job security, so they all vote for it. And then we, the taxpayers, are paying billions and billions and billions of dollars in the federal government and we get very little performance out of it. It's not that the people are necessarily bad, it's that the culture is counterproductive to performance. So when we've got all these people that not in incentivized to perform, it's a very sluggish and ineffective system. Very big, very expensive, very little actual result. So we've got to change that. And once we can get the federal government singing and performing up to, to full speed, then we can make a lot of these things more effective. We could lock down the border. Uh, border Patrol, Customs Border Patrol will have what they needed uh, with the proper funding, the proper manpower, and they should get the proper pay. That's another thing. A lot of the Border Patrol guys, their senior, most experienced agents have left because back in the Obama administration, he humiliated the Border Patrol and he gave them a pay cut, which none of the other federal agencies suffered or endured. So what kind of message is that? The message that they took was that they don't matter, that they're not valued. Their job's not important. 
And so they went elsewhere to find a job that they could better support their family with. So are the ones there now good people? Yeah, most of them. Is there corruption? Sure, there's corruption in every corner of our society. Federal law enforcement, local law enforcement, the church. I'm sad to say it's it's everywhere. But most of the people, I still believe, are good. And I think they want to do a good job. Nobody goes in the federal government to do a, a junky job and to embarrass themselves and dishonor their families and dishonor their agencies. They get lulled into that sense of complacency by the culture there. So we need leadership throughout the chain of command and federal law enforcement. Set the culture there that we will absolutely be effective and motivate and pay the people the bonuses that do well. A lot of the agents from the Border Patrol that came to work under my supervision while I was in the Air Marshal Service came from the Border Patrol and they're like, you know, boss, if we caught too big of a group of criminal invaders, our headquarters would make us let them pass because it would make the stats look bad. So if we didn't stop them and we just let them walk right past us, then the stats looked better and our bosses were happier. So this is the kind of fraud, waste and abuse and gross mismanagement that we've got to break and correct in our federal government. I saw it in the Air Marshal Service too. The Air Marshal Service was one of the absolute worst. You put the right people in there. You put people with integrity and the moral standards that really care enough to do a good job. You pay them properly and you incentivize them to be productive and effective. And then you absolutely remove those that will not be productive. And that thereby heals and keeps the culture there very strong and upbeat. Because I'm here to tell you, when someone sloughs off and they put their feet up and they don't care and they barely show up at all, it demoralizes the people that are pulling the sled with all their heart and soul. You know, the people that are showing up early and making good things happen and risking their life and, and really going above and beyond, it's demoralizing to them to see a guy that does next to nothing, taking the same amount of money home to his family without all the stress, right? So it's a cultural thing. We're talking about people. We're humans. You know, all of us, this is a human condition. We And in the civilian population, we just have to figure out how to be real again, how to be smart, how to make things more intelligent in the future. And we won't have these kind of crises where our borders being exploited, like we don't know what we're doing, like the most powerful superpower on the face of the planet can't defend its own border against a third world country, right? It's silly. It's silly. And I think if we, if we support our elected officials and we elect out those who do not support our president, then we can start getting better performance and our entire country will start being smarter. There'll be a lot less wasted money and all the citizens will have more income and money and security and freedom and liberty and happiness to enjoy. Wow. Well, now that you put it that way, I elect, and I'm sure everyone else does, Craig Sawyer for Border Task Force Team. <laughs> well, listen, <laughs> but all joking aside, Craig, if you had Trump's ear, what would you suggest, given your incredible background, what would you suggest to President Trump if he was listening? I would say, Mr. President, for the love of God, run a query, round up people in the current and former Customs and Border Patrol. Just, just talking about the, the border issue specifically right now. Round up the people that left that are highly experienced and great performers. Send a task force within the, the Border Patrol and separate everyone and ask every one of them. First of all, you have to absolutely protect these agents and their disclosures. They can't testify to you and have it used against them. That's a no-go. So if you can't find a system whereby you can take their private testimony and absolutely grant them protection, you're not going to learn anything. But if you have the will to say, look, you know, I'm in charge of this. This is my task force. The buck stops with me. Here's how your information is going to be handled. And here's why nobody's going to get a hold of it that doesn't need to. Then they can gain the confidence and open up and share with you without uh, fear of reprisal against a national security whistleblower. So that's, that's job one. So I would say, Mr. President, send a task force in there of good people that you know who have the moral integrity and ethical standards to head this thing up in, in righteous form and to go get that agency back on its mission charter with a 100% full steam authority and motivation. And you would have to separate everybody and just ask them questions like, okay, who are the people here that make all the best things happen? Who are the people here who are causing the log jam? Who are the people that are biggest bureaucrats and, and grind everything to a halt? Who is it that's got our, our country's back? Who is it that are subversive? You know, who are the performers who are not? And you'll, you'll gain a pattern. You may have some liars along the way, but there'll be anomalies. They won't fit in with the general pattern and the math that you start to develop. You know, here's a proven bass Here's a disproven basket and there's an unknown basket. As you sort through the information you, you get, one or two of those baskets will be overwhelmingly full and you'll, you'll start to understand the real dynamic. So then you would need authority 
to go and remove those who are absolute subversives, who are causing the log jams or who are causing the agency to be ineffective, get rid of them, fire them, or prosecute them if they're criminally implicated, right? Run a legitimate investigation. Be very careful. Be surgical in your identification. Those that are genuinely guilty of cause and harm, I absolutely prosecute them, make examples of them. Those that have shined, that have risked their lives, that have gone above and beyond and make good things happen, promote them, celebrate them for all the others to be more motivated to follow and you would see that agency absolutely turn around you should pay them what they're worth it's a hard job been down there supporting them we're climbing up these mountains it's rough it's tricky they're facing armed oppositions a lot of time it's a situation where these guys are on the front lines defending our country they need to be paid a respectful wage there's a lot for an agent to know to really be part of the solution and be effective so they need to be on the job for a while and as long as they're held to a high standard uh, they should be welcome to stay and uh, and be promoted and people be fighting to get into the Border Patrol if the culture were run that way. Yes. Well, there's so many layers to this, too. I mean, again, rip crews, narcos, mobs of criminals. But then there's also that whole layer of the child sex trafficking, which we're going to touch on what Vets for Child Rescue, your operation, is doing to combat that. But what in all of this, after covering this for months, when you kind of step back and take a macro view, what surprises you the most in all of this? I don't know if there's any really great surprises. I think the biggest surprise for me personally, Sheila, is learning firsthand through personal experience and kind of a boots on the ground exposure to it is how little the American people are informed on it. That's upsetting for me. Because if you love people, you want them empowered. And knowledge is power. So I always say, beware of the dividers and beware of the deceivers. Why is it that our mainstream news media refuses to inform the American citizens on things like rip crews? I would ask everybody out there, do you even know what a rip crew is? If you ask anybody that's in law enforcement down there or anybody that lives on a ranch, they'll readily tell you rip crews are drug runners in the United States that ambush and shoot to death the cartel's drug mules and take their dope loads. They ambush them for their dope loads. They shoot to kill everybody. They're notorious, the rip crews are, for not having any regard for human life. They'll kill everybody and they just take their drugs to sell it for themselves. So usually they'll try to do it as close to I-10, Highway I-10, that runs from coast to coast as possible. Why? Because they'll let the the narco traffickers do all the hard work, bring it up from Central to South America or the meth labs just across the fence in Mexico. And by the way, you can stand there and look across the fence and see meth labs, they huge ones. And you know how toxic methamphetamine is. It ruins people's lives. It's absolutely destructive. It kills people daily. They cook all this stuff up there by the boatloads now. And they traffic this in. It's a kind of thing where you can look right there and see it. And why are the American public not not, well, not made aware of it? So Rip Crew will take their stuff, let them bring it in. And then right before they load it into trucks or like right before their trucks make it out to I-10, they'll just shoot everybody to death and take it and go sell it for themselves. Well, yeah. as a criminal enterprise, I guess that makes sense. If you're going to be a crook, you know, just ambush the other crooks and take their stuff after they've done most of the, the hard work. Well, why does that matter to the American public? Well, because a lot of this is happening on state park land and there are citizens down there picnicking, completely oblivious and unwitting. Now, there are signs in some of these places, warning, beware, there's illegal trafficking and narcotics trafficking in this area. Well, what what does a civilian really understand about what that means? They don't understand that it means there's a full-on Afghanistan-style ambush with AK-47s between groups of uh, cartel drug runners. One cartel group ambushing in another or ones that live here in the States ambushing them. A full-on machine gun fire in a national park. Shouldn't we not be made aware of that in good faith? Why is it not? And that's what ticks me off, Sheila. That's what really gets my hackles up. So I'm like, okay, everybody knows that this is the case down here. But when you get away from the border, it's just a few miles north, 70 miles north. Typically across I-10, people are not aware. They're not told about it. So we were running an operation a couple of weeks ago on our side of the border. And we were tracking groups that were coming into the state park late at night and picking up criminal invaders and aiding and abetting them and driving them deeper into the United States. So helping our criminal invaders. We have betrayers. 
traders, traders that are helping those that are criminally invading our, our country. Again, we don't know who all they are. We've got ISIS coming in. We've got Al Qaeda coming in. We're finding Korans. The Border Patrol will tell you uh, a percentage of the paraphernalia and stuff left in the desert for everybody that thinks that it's just poor Mexican people. And that's not the case. There's everybody. There's up to 60 countries of people coming into our country. They've got diseases. They're not health checked. They're desperate. They're terrorists. When you don't know who's coming in, you get literally everything. And that's what's happening. So it's a really ugly situation that American people are are unwittingly wandering into and they get butchered on a regular basis. So we're looking at these these vehicles and, and uh, if we see that they're they're picking up loads of criminal invaders, we're calling them in so that Customs and Border Patrol can interdict them and arrest them, right? So there's one, we're like, ah, well, they're hiding down there in the valley. Let's go sneak up and identify them and call them in. And one of the agents uh, that was with us at the time said, hey, you know what? That's actually a hu- one of those goofy humanitarian groups. They think they're doing good by bringing water to the cartel drug runners and they don't even apparently understand who they're dealing with or that uh, they're just as likely to get killed and butchered down here and strung up in a tree as they are you know, some sort of thank you. So I would just want people to know, hey, look, I appreciate your soft heart. I've got a soft heart for legal migrants that come here respectfully and honor our country and our culture and embrace it. Some of my best friends have come here from other countries. And quite frankly, they appreciate what we have in the United States more than a lot of the spoiled people that that were born and have grown up here. Because so many incubated and sheltered Americans have been provided such a safe haven of security that they don't even perceive, they don't don't even conceptualize what the level of aggression and violence a percentage of mankind are inherently steeped in. There's just a percentage of mankind that will absolutely murder you and rape you and take your stuff unless you're prepared to stop them with overwhelming force. That's just reality. And it pains me that people don't know history, that they don't know conflict, and that they don't think that that's what a percentage of people are automatically going to do. There is a percentage. Whether it's 20 or 30 percent, we can debate that, but there are people who are just going to be terrorists. They're just going to be MS-13. They're just going to be violent criminals, and the, the prisons are full of them, and it's fact. So we, we can't be naive and go wandering down, oh, let's go pet the nice immigrants and let's bring the children, you know, because you're probably going to encounter the unthinkable, first of all. And second of all, what are you doing? Shame on you helping people who are coming here illegally and cutting the line in front of respectful, honorable migrants who have waited their turn, they're paid their fees, done their paperwork. They're coming here to be productive members of our society, honestly. And shame on you people for grabbing criminal invaders and escorting them straight into our country and line jumping. Nobody likes a line jumper. Yeah, you got that right. Well, Craig, very exciting. Congratulations on your two-year anniversary, by the way, with Vets for Child Rescue. And for those who don't even have a clue what that is, give us a little bit of an overview of what's happened the last two years. I see billboards springing up, your logo splashed on NASCAR, whisperings of Charlie Daniels. Lots has happened and lots is yet to come. Yeah, man. Well, as a capable special operations veteran, I've enjoyed a lot of training and real world experience. I've been to 60 countries myself in different type of operations. I realized that if I want to make good things happen, I've got quite a bit of capability, but I can't do it by myself. And when I began learning more about child trafficking and that it was a estimated $150 billion industry and that it is the fastest growing criminal enterprise on earth, I started talking to some of my federal agent buddies that were a part of different operations and, and arrests and they, and they just said, Craig, this will this will make you sick at your stomach, this. This is the darkest thing you will ever encounter. And they said, you know, there's an element of politics behind it. There's an element of blackmail there. Yes, there's a criminal element to it because there's financial benefit. It's very lucrative. So, yes. And there is a, a sexual perversion element to it. Yes, there are the, those that get off on raping children. But there's another aspect of it that's just almost inexplicable. There's a dark negative energy that inhabits a certain demographic or group of people that get off on doing the unthinkable to the most precious 
and innocent entities on earth was just God's precious and innocent little children. And, you know, God says uh, very harsh things about those who would harm the children. It's the front line between good and evil. What's going on against children? They are, it's just like a systematic process whereby they're buying children and they're just doing these ridiculously dark and heinous things to them, the worst things they can think of, because they think they get special powers or privileges. That's their, that's how lost and misguided they are. They expect to get some sort of benefit from the dark side, if you will. So just really psychotic people, but sadly, a lot of them are very wealthy and a lot of them are very powerful people. So you've got a wide spectrum. You've got people raping kids that are just meth addicts and homeless people or trailer park folks that, you know, they're just poor and they're sex perverts or they're just sadistic. I mean, you've got organized groups selling them and trafficking them. And then you've got the elite perverts that are doing their sick and weird stuff. So there's a wide spectrum of things that's happening to the kids, but every bit of it breaks my heart, Sheila. I'm a, I'm a hard and capable warrior, but children hold a soft spot in my heart, man. And I just realized I could not look away. And that's how we got here, by the way, is so many people turning away from that topic, which is so abhorrent and repulsive to us all. And since people don't want to necessarily always take action, they don't want to know about it. Because if we understand what's going on, we inherently feel a responsibility to do a little something to help. And sadly, a lot of people would rather turn away and lie to themselves and pretend that it's not happening. And another problem is that the mainstream news media is not covering this. At least we've got the responsibility to inform each other to the degree we understand where the threat is. How can we safeguard ourselves and our children from a threat that we don't know exists? Sheila, if you had cancer, God forbid, and I were your doctor, wouldn't you want me to tell you about the threat? Like, you know, we need to take action against this so we can save the day, right? You've yeah. got to take action against the, th the threats that will kill you and destroy entire generations. And so that's one of the things culturally that are needed. So I realized because the public don't know about it, that a documentary sharing it and walking the American people through and showing them what actually happens with the children and these child predators that they could un finally understand and see it and know what action to take. So some people can volunteer in a wide spectrum of ways. Some can donate to help run our operations. And most of us should absolutely hound our elected officials for stronger enforcement against this to safeguard our children or start a nonprofit organization of their own or a help group. You know, there's a lot of things that we can do. And for the love of God, please, pray. Pray for the children. Pray for the victims. Pray for our organization and our mission and our operators and our staff that are that are going through all kinds of attack and bureaucratic restrictions and frustration. I mean, the lawyers will readily tell you, man, if, if people knew just how difficult it was to satisfy all the bureaucratic red tape, they would never start a nonprofit organization and try to do anything to help anybody. It's absolutely prohibitive. It's restrictive. It's, it's well, it's prohibitive. I think it's the best word to really to put on it. We need to beat back and free up some of the, the legislation that keeps good people from doing good things. A lawyer would say, well, we need all these regs because bad people screw it up. Well, I would say, let's enforce the law and make examples of the bad people so we have less of them ruining everything so that we good people can act in good faith with a lot less regulation and restrictions and make the world a better place, right? You fix things on multiple fronts. So that's what I decided to do, shoot a documentary. So we spent 18 months filming a documentary that we were calling Contraland, showing our sting operation. We run joint operations with federal and local law enforcement, putting out ads and letting the predators come for the children. And boy, did they ever. They would come by in the hundreds and hundreds of responses in just a matter of minutes or hours. There's no shortage of child predators out there desperate to come and do things to children. So we would uh, arrest them and prosecute them uh, with law enforcement. It was fantastic work. So we, we would film all this. I went to Asia and ran operations with other NGOs, non-government organizations of regular civilians that would just go into the bars and brothels and identify underage girls and boys that were in the sex industry who were there by duress, who did not want to be sold for sex, but they felt stuck there. They were they were financial slaves. Their parents had sold them into it, all, all manner of scenario. 
So we would do what we call soft rescues and identify those that didn't want to be there and help get them out. That was very inspiring and important work that I was thankful to be a part of. We filmed all of that. So with our documentary and series, we can start to share that with the American public so they can see and realize this is huge. Two thirds of all Western men as an example, that get off of any airplane in Bangkok, Thailand, are there to take part in the sex industry, pay for sex. And a portion of that is underage sex, children. They go there and they go to South America to do that because they think they can get away with it more. So we've, uh, Vets for Child Rescue, are developing relationships with international law enforcement and in the foreign countries, Cambodia, Thailand, Philippines, whereby we can coordinate with them to uh, identify sexual predators that are leaving the United States to go on a sex vacation there, and they will arrest them as soon as they get off the plane. That's a beautiful thing. One of our board of advisors members, Bob Hamer, used to work in the FBI. He was a Marine and an FBI agent. He went undercover inside of NAMBLA, the North American Man-Boy Love Association, open pedophiles who go around exploiting and raping boys. Bob Hamer was undercover And uh, he got eight convictions inside of NAMBLA, some of their key figures. So God bless Marines and FBI agents and Christian family men like Bob Hamer that would uh, help defend the children from these rapists. Some uh, Some of them kill themselves over it. They're just so torn and distraught. And they're like, why didn't I fight harder when that man was raping me? I was just a boy. Should I, should I have fought harder? Am I, does that make me a homosexual? There's just a lot of garbage that is, is put into these boys heads and it's, and it's tragic and I want to fight for them. And I, I, I want to prevent it genuinely. I had a fantastic upbringing and father, and and I I didn't suffer through any of that. But I empathize with those who have, because I interview them all the time. And they can explain to me, they can articulate as adults why they were not okay with it and why it was psychologically shattering and how they respond to literally everything in their life differently than they would normally if they were healthy-minded because of it. It's absolutely destructive. It can never be okay. We must all link arms and stand up against it for the children. That's why we have to protect them. They are defenseless. Well, and part of doing just that, raising awareness, is your documentary. Talk about that and where things are at with it. Yeah, Sheila, we're, we're grateful. It looks like Contraland will be back in our physical possession next week. So it's been a long legal situation, and we're grateful for that development. It looks like now there will actually be two feature film documentaries rather than just the one because we've got so much content it looks like we'll be able to actually make a part two and share even more with it so that's exciting and our documentary series has been pitched since mid-january across the entire entertainment industry so all of the major networks and so we're hopeful that that gets uh, picked up soon that would help fund a lot more of our operations and really uh hit the afterburner so that's fantastic and You mentioned Mike Harmon Racing. Mike has been the most fantastic ally in this fight. He's worn our Vets for Child Rescue logo and website and instant text messages on his car all season and part of last season. In a race coming up in in Dover, Delaware, we are going to join with uh, Charlie Daniels. All of the placement on Mike's team, Mike Harmon Racing's car at the Monster Mile in Dover. And uh, we will be on there as well. And so Charlie Dens is going to have a a concert there at the race and we'll join him on stage. So it's just a beautiful and fantastic opportunity to get the word out and let people know about a problem that we can all fix as a society if we know about it. And so that's why it's exciting to get things like the billboards and the NASCAR placement and the celebrities mentioning us and all the social media shares and likes and the videos because we have to get the word out so that people can unite against this problem. Well, we are certainly looking forward to that. And another thing that we're looking forward to, and I guess we can announce this to the listeners, you heard it here first, folks. Talk about a little exciting project that you have in the works. I'll let you talk about it. Well, I took a group down to the border not long ago, and one of the young ladies from Turning Point USA mentioned, she said, Craig, you know, you should start your own show. You should call it something like Craig Talks instead of TED Talks. I'm like, that's interesting thought. Let me let me crunch on it. And I started talking to some of my, my my friends that had been in broadcasting and different show hosts and so forth. And they all agreed to Craig, man, it was, it'd be fantastic if you do that. We really think you'd have something to, to share with your own culture and experience and contacts. And I thought, okay, let me figure out what we want to call it. And I put out uh, a poll and everyone chose Sawman Says. 
as the the most fun and and uh, likely name for it. So I decided, okay, it's, we're going to call it Saw Man Says, and it's going to be a talk show. I'm going to try to do most of the episodes live on video, and I'm going to talk to different experts and different people of significance for different things. And my entire motivation is really going to be to bring unity and get rid of a lot of the labeling and the divisiveness that has been used to divide us and scatter us before our enemies so that we would lose our freedom and liberty. Together we are what we can't be alone, and united we stand. I see that. I believe that firmly. And so I just want to share some of my positive culture on that front and bring information to people. I want to empower people with knowledge. So I want to have people on that know things, man. The general population uh, population doesn't always get to hear. Just for an example, I know the lead scientist on the last uh, Shroud of Turin. He's a physicist. Quantum physics and mechanics are his specialty. And his responsibility was to determine scientifically how the image came to be on the Shroud of Turin, which is believed to be the burial cloth of Jesus Christ. He's learned a lot of things and proven it scientifically that the, the general population hasn't yet known. And so some of the top scientists in the world that were part of this global delegation of scientists know about it because they read the final report on it and they've all studied the thing. But, you know, Joe Public doesn't know this stuff yet. So that's an example of things that I just want to bring and go like, man, it wouldn't it be cool to know this. This is why we're here on this planet. The res- resurrection is absolutely known. It's fact now. That changes is everything for a lot of societies, a lot of cultures. I mean, a lot of people think, oh, well, the resurrection, that's just a fairy tale. And so things like that, I want to just talk to people and empower them and have people on their experts on how to safeguard your kids, man, and just different things like that. So Sawman says it's going to be a fun and a very laid back, casual, just two people talking, man, about different things, but always with a spirit of unity that people can take away knowledge that will empower and enrich their lives and, uh, and, and make our world a better place. So that's what Salman Says is, and I'll start having my first guests appear soon. It's, it'll just be a side project, maybe once a, a week, because I'm so busy with Vets for Child Rescue. But it, we'll see how it resonates and how the, the episodes do. And if people want more, maybe it can grow into something more significant, make a bigger contribution. We'll just have to see. Well, move over, Joe Rogan, because the Salman is coming in. Well, listen, <laughs> Craig, it was such a pleasure to have you on. I want my listeners also, by the way, to know that the apple does not fall far from the tree. Craig's dad was an amazing minister, deliverance, spiritual warfare, a total warrior. So you come by it honestly, Craig. I'm sure your dad would be very proud. Thank you so much for your service, sir. Thank you for apprising us on what's going on at the border. Thank you for what you do with Vets for Child Rescue. We probably could have spent the entire show talking about Craig's impressive list of accolades, but thank you for shedding the light on the cockroaches, beating back the king of darkness. So thank you so much for everything that you do. And thank you for your time in coming on the program today, sir. Well, thank you, Sheila. And uh, I never stop being surprised by more and more things that I've learned that you've contributed. You're a warrior of your own sort by getting the truth out past the gatekeeper. So God bless you for everything you've done and continue to do because you're a bold one and you bring the truth when so many people are too timid, quite honestly, in my opinion, to bring the real truth to the people so that they know it, whether they like it or don't like it, or whether it might be a popular truth. You've got the courage to do that. You have my respect for that. I want you to know that's sincere just from my observations over the years watching you go. So thank you for what you do, man. If we had more like you, the world would be a better place. Thanks, Craig. Coming from you, that means a lot. Folks, the website is up on your screen there, Vets for Child Rescue. That's vets, the number four, childrescue.org. Reach out to Craig. Let him know you heard him on the program. Share this video, folks, on your social media. You know, the kind of algorithms and shadow banning and all the stuff that these Silicon Valley-owned social media companies. So comment, like, and share this video. And also go donate to Vets for Child Rescue. Craig, always a pleasure. We look forward to coming back real soon. Thanks again for coming on. Thank you, Sheila. Take care. Folks, that was Craig 
Greg Sawman Sawyer. His information is up on your screen. Listen, I meant what I said about go donate. You cannot imagine what these guys are up against when it comes to beating back this kind of pure evil. You don't think they're in a spiritual war? You don't think these guys are going to get some backlash? Well, don't kid yourself. We're in a battlefield here, Christians. And I like what Craig said earlier in the program. Pray for Craig and his team. This is important work. And I'll say it again. Children are our most precious commodity. End of story. You harm a child. Well, what does the Lord say in his word? Better a millstone be tied around your neck. Child sex trafficking, folks, is an epidemic. And it is important that we support these people on the front lines that are fighting this atrocity. So again, that's the number four, childrescue.org. Go over and make a donation. If you have the means, go make a, a hefty donation for what those guys are going through. And you don't know the half of it. Trust me. Like I said, let's be praying for Craig and his team. We have a fantastic lineup coming up for the rest of the week. So make sure that you are subscribed to my YouTube channel. Follow me on social media. You're going to love my tweets. And trust me, you want to follow my Instagram. If you have Instagram, you definitely want to follow some of my custom memes. They'll keep you in stitches. Make sure you're following both my show page and my Sheila Zelensky page on Facebook. And lastly, we have a really exciting new thing we can offer our listeners. So I'll leave you here at the end of the show with a new advertisement that we just put out. See you real soon. Hi, everyone. This is Sheila Zielinski. How would you like to advertise your product or service with us? We have a very robust audience as well as a large social media reach, and we should be supporting Christian businesses. If you're interested in advertising your product or services with us, send us an email at info at Sheila.media. That's info at Sheila.media. And one of our sales staff will get in touch with you to see if your product or service is a good fit. And until the end of May, we're offering a special spring discount on all our advertising packages that can be tailored to fit your budget. Consider advertising on The Sheila Zielinski Show. That's info at Sheila.media. Make the inquiry today and get your business noticed.